I'm David Hawking, and you're listening to Gospel Tangents. The best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm excited to have David Hawking on the show. He's kind of a self-taught scriptorian, and he's got some amazing books of scripture. Today we're going to talk about the New Testament, the Book of Mormon, Book of Jasher, Book of Enoch, and the Book of Isaiah. So these are going to be some amazing resources. He's got some amazing uh, art information about artifacts in here, um, some red lettering when God speaks. He form, he's got a lot of notes uh, in addition so that you can learn more about these amazing books. You know, with uh, Christmas coming up here, uh, the New Testament is going to be very useful. So you might want to think about that as a Christmas present. So anyway, um, we're going to get more acquainted with David. We're going to find out that his copy of the Book of Mormon is at the Duke Divinity School. So it's definitely a conversation you won't want to miss. Check it out. Welcome to Gospel Tangents. I'm excited to have an amazing scholar and uh, scriptorian. Can I give you that title? Yes. <laughs> so tell us your name and where you're from. I'm David Hawking, and I'm from Raleigh, North Carolina. But that doesn't sound like a Raleigh, North Carolina accent. That's correct, because I was born and raised in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. That doesn't sound like you're from Boston, either. And that's because, I lived there for four years. That's because when I got to be a student at BYU in 1969, the bishop of the student ward was a speech pathologist. Oh, really? Yes, and uh, he would have me over his house uh, for family night, because I was a fish out of water. I didn't have any family or friends or anybody. And he kind of took pity on me, as a good bishop would. And uh, so after the uh, meal and a family night, we'd go into the basement and I'd put the headphones on <laughs> and I would have to, you know, take my R's like Donner and say Donna. <laughs> instead of say Pack, I would say park, mm -hmm. you know, instead of saying water, I would say water. I used to park my car at Harvard Yard. Yeah, that's it. So anyways, that's why I have hopefully a little bit more of a generic accent. <laughs> well, I would have never guessed you were from, did you say Cape Cod? Yeah, Cape Cod Hyannis is where I was born Hyannis. and raised. Yeah. Wow. So Red Sox, Celtic. Yeah, Rangers. that's it. Karl Yastrzemski was oh, the big yeah. time. Yeah, that's it. I, I, I watched Jazz play in person at Fenway. That's it. There you so, go. Yeah. So we go way back. Well, good. I'm glad to hear you're a Red Sox fan. So. <laughs> well, awesome. Well, um, tell us why we're here today. We're here because you uh, and I were... Uh, first had our meeting at a conference called the Firm Foundation and the Salt Palace. And uh, I mentioned that I had liked your podcast and I'd been watching it on YouTube. And then we had a brief conversation and evidently you said, you're an interesting man, I'd like to talk to you. <laughs> well, you've rewritten the Book of Mormon, the Bible, well, I guess it's just the New Testament. Can you, can you show us, you've got five books of scripture here. Yeah, so this is the beginning amazing. of uh, the, uh, my journey into uh, the world of um, taking uh, sacred scripture and uh, put it in a format that is more um, easier to comprehend and to read, as well as to uh, highlight the beauty of the scripture. So this was my first foray, uh, foray into it, and uh, this was published in 2018. Uh, it was, it's a collaboration of what I did to reformat the text, and then also um, to incorporate information that I believed in and I learned uh, from many sources, many of which were a part of the Firm Foundation or the Heartland, if you want to call it theory, of where the Book of Mormon took place. And that meant something to me and I wanted to incorporate some of those elements into the narrative. And so Rod Meldrum, I reached out to him. He thought that what I had done was uh, something that would be of interest to him. I then uh, visited with him and then that collaboration occurred and others got involved. So this is my first foray. Once I did this, I then said, you know, I've got the format down. I think I'd like to continue. So I then did the next book was the, um, of all things, called the Book of Jasher. And I'll, I'll refer to that a little bit later. But it's an interesting book, a great provenance. And in fact, um, 
once the original publisher, which is a uh, New York Jew by the name of uh, Mordecai Noah, once he passed away, the copyright and the licensing of this book uh, went to the J.H. Perry Company out of Salt Lake City. So the <laughs> consumer of this book of Jasher were actually Mormons. Yeah. So the next one that came after that was the book of Isaiah. And so this one was uh, my personal journey to take the divine commandment of all of the scriptures. When you think of all the books, there's only one book that the Lord has given a divine commandment, and that is to search Isaiah casually. No, no, no. To, to search Isaiah <laughs> by just reading a few verses and then passing over it. No, no. I mean, he said that you have to search Isaiah diligently. And I didn't do that. And here I am in my late 60s. Now I'm 70, going on 72. And I said, you know what? I'm going to do that. So this is my effort to search Isaiah diligently. And then after that, I then went into the book of Enoch. And I did this because I took a class from Hugh Nibley in my senior year at BYU in 1975, Senior Topics of Religion. And we went to the Joseph Smith Library, and there was maybe 15, maybe max 20 of us around the library table, and Hugh Nibley was with all his disheveled look to him with all of his notebooks and papers and, you know, and he would just rattle on like Hugh Nibley does. Uh, and then at the end of the semester, in my senior year, uh, uh, no quizzes, no tests until the last day of class. And on the chalkboard was, what are Joseph Smith's credentials? And I had to write an essay. We all had to. So if he was still living today, I'd present this to him. <laughs> And hopefully he would say, you're the Hugh Nibley heir apparent. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, that's why I did this, and we'll get into that. Okay. And my final one is um, the Joseph Smith translation of the New Testament. And uh, I went ahead and uh, is bold enough and have the gumption to take uh, the challenge, if you want to call it that, by uh, being bold enough to research the provenance of that uh, manuscript that Joseph Smith called as his, uh, call, his um, another calling that he had that was given to him by the Lord, a branch of his calling, uh, to revise uh, the errors and the interpolations of men that uh, were part of the Bible. And so in 1867, the reorganized church published it. And so this is in the public domain, the text. And so I went ahead and um, felt that that would be important. We, uh, as members of the Utah Mormon Church, if you want to call it that, we've never had the full benefit of everything that Joseph Smith did by way of commandment. And because of that, I felt that since next year would be Come Follow Me in the New Testament, what better opportunity for we as church members to actually read what Joseph Smith contributed. So this is my latest book. That's awesome. That's awesome. So one of the things that was most impressive to me was the, you know, not only have you put the words of Jesus in red, I think that's probably one of the easiest, uh, most noticeable things, but you've added a lot of scholarship to, yes. the, to these books as well. Um, so do you want to start with the Book of Mormon first, since that was the first one? Yes. So I think this is going to be an interesting story for yeah. you to... And then before we get there, I just wanted to get your educational background and everything like that. Good. So um, I'm a graduate of BYU. I got two degrees there. Uh, the first is in electronic engineering. Okay. And that was in 1971. Then I went on my mission to England, London South Mission. Okay. And I'm in the home right now of my missionary companion. And he and I were companions for many uh, months while we were on a mission. And we were in a singing group, too, called the Family Portrait Singers. Uh -huh. So anyways, uh, so I came back from my mission, and uh, I then majored in microbiology and chemistry. Oh, the, wow. the, so the goal of what I wanted to do was become a pedodontist, which is a child's dentist. And, uh, but that was an era when I was the baby boomer, I, born in 1951. That's, if you look at the Gaussian distribution of 
children being born after the war, I'm in that highest peak. And so for the number of people uh, going to medical school or dental school was enormous. So for everyone that got in, there was like 150 applicants. So, and at the same time, not to denigrate this, but for the first time in that time frame, there were more women applying than ever before. So therefore, um, the chances of, if you didn't have superior, ultra superior um, uh, uh, grades, it, it would be hard to get in. So I had to look for a different course. Um, so that's why I went into microbiology and, um, and chemistry, knowing that if I didn't get into medical school, at least I could do something in that. So right out of, right out of college, I got to work at, at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. And my research I was given to do was in uh, virology. And uh, at BYU, I took a 600 level course in virology. and. Uh, so you can say that I have some really practical knowledge about viruses and vaccines and so forth. But so that's where I came from. And then after that, I got into business and then business took me into a field that um, I became an expert in. And that expertise uh, allowed me to travel the world. And the expertise had to do with hemoglobin disorders and the separation of hemoglobin variants. And the hemoglobin molecule is very complex. There's what they call globin chains. There's betas and alphas and gammas and you know all these different things. So I became an expert in that field because I was part of a company that uh, formatted a procedure to separate different hemoglobin uh, variants. And I was the one that understood what the pattern recognition was. So I wrote a book on how to interpret hemoglobin variants. That book brought me into uh, the field of uh, teaching others and traveling the world. I got a call from a doctor from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia called Dr. Ohini Frempong, and he was setting up a sickle cell conference in Africa, and he asked that I be the uh, teacher for the laboratory, laboratory diagnostic uh, way of interpreting the uh, uh, variants, as well as the thalassemias and the and the iterations and what that means. So I went over to Ghana and I did the course over there. And then eventually I ended up with a couple patents uh, in that field. So that's my background. My wow. background happened to be in the sciences. So you got an electrical engineering degree and then went into microbiology. Yep. Very, very heavy in science. Wow. Wow. Well, we are the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology, so. There you go. <laughs> I was going to say you sound kind of similar to Greg Prince. I know he's been into yeah. that yeah. kind of area as well. Yeah. So. Yep, so that's, that's my background. And so, actually, that helps you kind of get an idea of, of the, uh, what I call the logical thinking, if you want to use that term, of how I approach what I did with the scriptures. So that then leads into... What 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 is the mechanism that makes the Book of Mormon when I first when it first came out? What was the thing that made it different than any other edition that you could get? And the difference is how I formatted the text, and the textual formatting is something I always knew had to be redone. And the reason why I say this is that the tools and the technology that was used when the scriptures were being first recorded anciently, and then when the printing press came and the type of printing processes, and then when the Book of Mormon came about, the Book of Mormon had, you know, uh, the full scrap paper, they call it, and handwriting. And, and so there was a man who was working at the uh, Grandin Press by the name of John Gilbert. And so here's a picture of John Gilbert. Okay. And he is the one that was responsible for typesetting the handwritten document. But the handwritten document had no capitalization, no periods, no commas, no nothing, no punctuation. So he did everything in pencil, and he wanted to take it home with him, but he was under commandment not to do so. But anyways, they relented. But it was John Gilbert that made, made what that original Book of Mormon looks like, the type font and how he's put it together. And uh, so anyway, so I said, you know, the mechanical way he did that in 1830 
is advanced to a, an electronic way of doing it. So we have computers, we have software, and I've always felt that scripture, there's things, if I peel back the layer of the text, that I can see the beauty of the text, the Hebrewisms of the text, the prophecy, who's speaking, uh, how quick the scripture's being quoted. So I came up with these stylized elements to help people see what they're reading. Right. And can you show us some more examples of that? Because that was what was really impressive to me. Because um, I, I know, I know. For example, you've got. Well, maybe I'm mixing it up with the New Testament. Uh, it's, they're all the same way. Okay. Yeah. So an example would be. Um, oh, let's go through here. So it, it, here's a, just a good page. I mean, here's a page where. As you read the text, you're going to see something that relates to the text. So they're going to go up to Jerusalem, and they're going to go down to the wilderness. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean they're going to go north, and then they're going to go south? Well, now I have a picture that says, well, here's where Jerusalem is, and this is where the wilderness is. So no matter where you're going, whether you're in Samaria, which is north of Jerusalem, when you read the text in the Bible, it says we're going to go up to Jerusalem. Or if you're in Jericho, which is a very a low place, which is still north of Jerusalem, you're going to go up to Jerusalem. Uh, whereas if you um, uh, uh, think in, in terms of north, south, east, and west, you won't get that. So I, I have a visual. I also have what I call little highlights in gold that will then relate to certain things that, uh, uh, that will give you an insight certain insights you'll see here. So now the textual uh, things that I do here is I, I create my own paragraph. I do all things in paragraphs versus versification. All the numbers that you see, the verse numbers, are superscript so that they don't get in the way, but they still correlate. And then when there's poetry, I show the poetry so that you actually, you, it slows you down and you look at it and you go, ooh. I didn't realize that that was there. That's how it should be read. Right. And so then when you get into the, um, the issue with uh, uh, the colors now, angels will be in blue. So now you know the voice Nephi is talking. That's in the first person, I, Nephi. But all of a sudden an angel comes to him and the angel converses with a Nephi. So instead of having it in black like you do with Nephi, I change the color to a blue color. Then if the angel is quoting from the Lord, or if the Lord speaks to Nephi, it'll be in red. Now, the other thing that will be interesting that is a visual, is that if there is a prophecy associated with that, whether it be an angel, or uh, Nephi himself, or whoever's giving the prophecy, I will indent it. It's a way of visual cue to you that this is a special text, mm -hmm. because now it has something to do in the future. So these stylized elements make all the difference in how one comprehends what you're reading and it engages one. In fact, one of the uh, members that attended the conference this uh, week came up to me, Brother Hawking, I'm mad at you. What do you mean you're mad at me? What have I done? What have I said? No, I, 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 I go to the kitchen table and I get my Book of Mormon, I have a stand, I open it up, and I've been read, I read from it, and I have my, my uh, breakfast, and I'm reading, and I keep on reading, and I keep on reading, and I keep on reading, and now I get back, and I, get, I, I look at my clock, and I go, wait a minute, I'm way behind time, because I can't put it down. <laughs> In the past, I used to read like two or three chapters, and I get bored. I'm really mad at you. You've ruined my timing and my schedule <laughs> because I love your book. <laughs> so that's the, some of the elements I use. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Now, um, I'm trying to decide if this is a good place to jump in there. Um, you, you live in North Carolina. That's correct. And you're, you, tell us about where you live. There's a lot of PhDs there. That's correct. I live in Raleigh, which is part of the Triangle Park. Now, the Triangle Park was created by the, uh, by the state of North Carolina because of the three universities that dominate that area. You have the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, Duke University in Durham, and then North Carolina State University in uh, Raleigh. So who, who do you root for? 
It's difficult. Wolf pack, tar heels, or blue devils. And which really is interesting because you bring that up because when the temple was built there, the Raleigh Temple, the architect who also designed the stained glass windows, she came up with a brand new color of blue <laughs> because she didn't want to have any partisanship with <laughs> Carolina blue versus Duke blue. <laughs> so uh, it just so happens that our son was born in Durham, so we're... We kind of followed the Duke group only because he was born there, and uh, and so he became a Duke fan. And uh, but as far as I'm concerned, um, I root for them all. I'm for North Carolina, no matter who's in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, very cool. So, uh, was the Book of Mormon was that what you had presented to the Duke Divinity School? Yeah. So. When uh, I had first moved to North Carolina, which is in 1979, uh, the, um, we were in a branch, the Cape, uh, Cape Cod, the uh, Chapel Hill branch, and we were meeting in a junior high school, the Culberth Junior High School, so there's no church building, it had no facilities. And uh, the, uh, since uh, Richard Ross, Professor Ross was an English professor there, uh, when we first moved to that uh, branch, he was the gospel doctrine teacher, and he was, and it just so happened to be the Book of Mormon uh, time frame cycle, and uh, he opened my eyes up to the uh, beauty of the literary aspects of the Book of Mormon. Uh, he had just completed a book called The Literary Testimony of the Book of Mormon, uh, Feasting on the Word, and from retrospectively, now that I'm older, uh, I can look at that particular volume of um, uh, scholarship that he did as a pivotal point in my life, not only because I knew him personally, but because what he did and what he wrote affected me internally. And so from that internal moment that I recognized that this Book of Mormon is more than just words, or a spiritual thing, but there's actually literary qualities to it, and there's a literary testimony built within, whether it be chiastic forms or Hebrew poetry, all of the different elements that go into it. But at that moment, I says, if I ever had an opportunity to do what I envisioned, I would present it to the Duke Divinity School, because they're in my backyard. And the reason I thought that is because Duke Divinity School owns two original copies of the 1830 Book of Mormon. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they have two copies. And every once in a while, they'll have a notice, and they send it out through the newspapers as well as the media, is that they'll have a showing, a special showing of those books. And so in my mind, I thought in... If it ever happens, I would be able to make this go forward, that if I did it, I would present them with my version of the Book of Mormon. And it happened. Okay. And it happened when I was called to be the historical um, chairman of when the Raleigh Temple was uh, dedicated. And so I got a call from a, uh, Area 70, Brother Hawking, we'd like to have you be the, and write a book about the uh, temple, the open house, and so forth, and the rededication. So I was on the committee members' meetings, and one of them is, has to do with the um, VIPs and making sure that the governor knows about it and the media knows about it. And I brought up, does Duke Divinity School know about this? Yes, we need to do that. We need to let them know that they're coming. I had in my mind if somebody from the Duke Divinity School came, I would be alerted and therefore I would be prepared to let them know what I've done. And it came true. I got up one morning when the, there was two days of VIPs and I says, I'm just going to bring my Annotated Book of Mormon with me along with the Book of Jasher. I had already completed it. Oh, okay. And so they had the VIP tour. They then go back into the... Um, uh, the stake center where they have the displays and I had a really nice conversation with a, a really nice looking guy that looked like he was professional and I didn't really ask for his name nor did I know where he's from 
And, you know, because the conversation just flowed the way it flowed. And then he left. And I had that impression. I need to find out who he is. So he's just about exit to exit this, uh, the stake center. And I go, excuse me, what was your name? Again, I didn't catch it. And he gave me his name. I says, so, and, and where are you from? He says, I'm from the Duke Divinity School. Oh, I'm so glad I caught you before you left. Do you have any extra time? Yeah, I can do it. What do you, what, what do you have in mind? I says, just sit here on the sofa here in the foyer, and I'm going to get something for you. I'd like to show you something. So he sat down. I opened up. I gave him a book of Mormon to look. I says, I'd like to show this to you because I want to donate this book to the Duke Divinity School. He looks at me. He says, oh, okay. And he opens up the book and goes through the pages. He goes, wow. This is gorgeous. This is beautiful. Now, who are you again? <laughs> I go, well, I'm, I'm Brother Hawking, David Hawking. And, uh, and uh, are you a, a professor? No, no, I'm not. Gosh, this is great. And uh, oh, by the way, I also have this book of Jasher. You've got the book of Jasher? No one knows about that. And he, look, he takes the book, and he goes through, and he goes, who are you again? <laughs> he says, yeah. I says, I'd like to have, I'd like to come and donate these to you. He says, absolutely. We'd love to have you come. And so I had, uh, I had a, uh, an appointment and I got to meet the faculty mm -hmm. and the librarians and so forth. So we sat down on this big table and I brought several copies so people can look at uh, both, you know, the Book of Mormon and the Book of Jasher. And I says, I'd like to donate three Book of Mormons. I'd like to have one here in the Duke Divinity School Library, one in the General Library, and you can do whatever you want with the third. And one guy gets, I know what we're going to do with the third one. We're going to put it in the Duke Chapel. We have people, really? he says, we've got the Torah there, we've got the Old and New Testament, we've got the, you know, the Catholic Bible, we've got the uh, Hebrew stuff, and we've got the Koran. This would be perfect in that. Holy and God. so that's where it is. Wow. It's in the Duke Chapel. Now Duke, Duke is a religious university. What yep. is the what is the denomination? It's affiliate it was affiliated. Uh, I think it's the uh, Presbyterian or something like or it's not Lutheran because that's German. Um, but it's one of the Protestant groups, yes. Okay. But they were very and they in fact, they were just enamored that I would donate because they looked at it with the quality, because it's kind of like leather bound with the gold right. gilding yeah. and high quality images and red and letter, you know, red letter edition. And by the way, you bring that up because as a Protestant, um, I'm a convert to the church, and oh, I grew up in uh, uh, in New England, you know, Massachusetts. And virtually all of the Catholic Bibles and all the Protestant Bibles in that area are red letter editions. When I first showed that to Rod Meldrum. And that group, they had no clue what red lettering meant, because people here in Utah never have had a red letter edition. Now, to put it into perspective, we wanted to submit my work here, or our work, I should say, Rod Meldrum and the others, to uh, get permission from the church to use the current edition of the text, which is copyrighted by the church. The 1981 so edition? Yeah, so what we wanted to do is get their permission to use that text. And that's how I actually uh, did the formatting, was using that text. And uh, so what had happened then was uh, I kind of knew beforehand that they weren't going to do it. <laughs> uh, and the reason why I knew that beforehand is because previously, before Rod, I knew Rod Meldrum, before I knew anybody, any, anywhere, I had already formatted the Book of Mormon for my own personal use. And uh, I put it in a spiral bound. I printed all the pages out, put it in spiral bound. And I showed people that, oh, I love what you're doing. I want to buy one of those. So I have to print out every page. And I go to the thing and print out and get a spiral bound. And so I sent one to L. Tom Perry. Uh -huh. uh, he set me apart on my mission. He was the, oh, wow. he was the stake president at the time. Oh, yeah. yeah, in Boston. Yeah. In Boston. In Boston. And uh, so anyway, so I sent it to him. And unfortunately, he sent me back somewhat of a terse letter. Uh-oh. I mean, it was like, Brother Hawking, you've done a really remarkable job here. However, there are so many copyright issues, and I'm forwarding this to our legal department, and they will contact you oh, shortly. Oh, no. Yeah. So three weeks later, I get a letter from the legal department, you know, the intellectual reserves. 
brother hawking and you know wow you've done a good job here but and then they list all of the things that are copyright and i go bingo now i know not what to do and now i know what to do <laughs> unbeknownst to them okay. so i had then I, I went ahead and did the 1981 knowing they would re reject it but i had a plan because when I went my mission in 1971, what edition did I have? The 1920 edition that was done by James Talmadge. And you can get that online as a text. And there are sources where you can see where there's changes in that text. So in the, in the back here, I actually have a listing. It's somewhere in the appendix. And I list all of the different um, words that have been altered in the text. So. Um, anyways, between the 1920 yeah, and the 1981, yeah. I, so I have it all listed in there. So what I ended up doing was uh, when so Boyd Tuttle, myself, who's the publisher, Digital Legend Press, Rod Meldrum, uh, and Jonathan Neville and Ryan Nelson, we all had a meeting with the Scripture Committee in the church office building, and it was a very and there were general authorities there. Is 1920 public domain? I don't That's it. It is. Yeah. Okay. So so here's what happened. We go up there. All of the scripture committee members are there, general authorities. I can't tell you who. I'm, I'm under, under covenant not to tell. But anyways, uh, you know, they saw what I did. you're off camera. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, they, um, they saw my work. They, they appreciated it. In fact, I can tell you I got a lot of hugs. You know, like Brother Hawking, wow, you've done a great job. But anyways, they this said... This is the 1920 edition? No, this is yeah, what I had submitted to them, and they rejected it. Right. But here the, here's what they rejected. Not that, that it's just the 1981, because that is copyrighted. The text itself has been copyrighted, because, because what happened with the um, Royal Skousen and with his critical text project, looking at the original manuscript and the printer's manuscript, and then it went into 2013, I think, is when the updates have been coming. So they have been updating the text. Similar to what we do with the Joseph Smith translation of the New Testament, the 1867 is in the public domain. However, the Community of Christ has amended it, just like our church has amended text. And they have copyrighted those amendments so to protect themselves, which is good. It's a legal protection. But once it's out of, the, it's out of that uh, time frame, which I think is 75 years, then it's all, you know, then you, you're free to do what you want with it. So anyways, when they gave me in that meeting, they said, it's not that you can't use the text, which we're not going to give you anyways, but it's not that per se. It's because you have red lettering. We will never produce a red letter of the Book of Mormon. We just won't do it. Now, I hate to say this, and while I'm on camera, and it's going to go out the world, and people are going to hear this, but they also told me, and us, all of us that were there, and you've got a map it, you get maps in the Book of Mormon, and we'll never produce a Book of Mormon with uh, a map in it. Yeah. And then what? Two years. 1920 kind of had a map in it, right? Yeah, yeah. But now what we got is we've got the um, uh, BYU studies came up with their uh, thing with Grant Hardy out of North Carolina, um, Asheville. He and I have been pen pals, if you want to call it, email pals. He thinks I'm a scholar, <laughs> which is kind of cool. And, I had, and I've got permission from him to use some of his work in the Annotated Book of Mormon. Oh, nice. Yeah. So anyways, he... Um, what book has he written? He's written... Uh, his first one was the... Um, uh, that was published by Illinois Press was the... Um, oh, what's the title of it? You, Understanding you, the Book of Mormon? Yeah, something like that. But he had a, his version of the Book of Mormon. And what's scary... I mean, what's really scary is that we had not communicated at all. I had already done my work. I had submitted my work on how I formatted the text to L. Tom Perry, uh, Elder Perry. And, uh, and then all of a sudden his book comes out in Illinois Press a few years later. And it's almost as if there was some aura because he was doing similar to what I had done. And I, right. at first, thought he plagiarized me. Oh, wow. You know, not, I, I didn't tell him that, but I'm just saying, woo, this is strange. Yeah. Because when I sent him with my version, he goes, wow. I mean, I wish I had known about you. Because I would have liked your impression. So it's funny how that was all wow. happening right in North Carolina, of all places. Wow. You know? But anyways, 
So it's the red lettering and it is the, in the maps. Well, when the, So when, the church has an issue with red lettering? Yeah, they don't want it. Because it's too Catholic? Well, I don't know if it's that. I think it's they want the individual to study it and then find the voice on their own. Whatever. I don't, but I, I'm not going to yeah. figure out their view of it. But so they go, and then of course I have a blue lettering too. And I, I struggled with the fact that if I'm going to use the red lettering, I had to have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I can't have them, I will have them all red lettering, but I have to differentiate them from voices. They're different voices. They're not the same. Now, the, the Catholics and the Protestants think they're the same, but no, we don't. So when you get into the third Nephi, for example, uh, Christ will quote his Father, thus saith the Father. So I made the Father italicized red. Oh, okay. So now you see a different visually. You're saying, now the Father's talking. Okay. See, so I have these visual cues. And men are visual, right? Right. But it makes all the difference. No, it, I think it's awesome. I, I love what you've done. And I'm, I, don't, I don't understand what the aversion is to red lettering. And maybe it's because my dad, my dad's a convert. And yes. so we had red letter Bibles that I remember growing up. And I didn't. I just grew up with it. I didn't think any big deal. So here's what here's really the ultimate thing about the formatting. So if I if I concentrate on the formatting of the text only, then what what is there's 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 like an onion. You peel off this layer, and then you peel off this layer. Underneath this layer is another layer, another layer. So what happens when you do a, just a normal black uh, versification? You're missing a lot of what's behind those words and those sentences. When you put it in the format that what I've worked hard to do, it's like peeling off layers. You get to see the, you know, the voices. I put quotations mark. I make it a paragraph. It flows better. And then yeah. when there's a prophecy, you see that it's a prophecy. Now, if there's poetry in there, you see the beauty of, the pro of, of what is being said. And then when there's what you called inspired utterances, which becomes poetical, you see the inspired version. So there's a Psalm of Nephi, chapter uh, 4 and 2 Nephi. Well, I write it as poetry. It's a true psalm. And within that psalm, he is pulling from that psalm portions of psalms so there's fragments of psalms within his psalm and you get to see it and it's very complex similarly i do the same when you get to um the e, uh, the isaiah chapters within first and second nephi and even jacob they will quote many uh chapters and verses of isaiah now, in my annotated, I underline all of the differences that are not in the King James Version. So as you, you re open up my book, you go to Isaiah, and you'll read it, and you'll see underline, 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 underline. That's, he's not plagiarizing from his King James Version. He doesn't ha he's not doing it because there's so many differences. So, but here's what's good about that, is the fact that I'm... I'm I'm taking the effort to see the differences. Therefore, I have seen enough of the versification or the verses and the differences that when you then go and you continue with the narrative and now Nephi says, okay, now I've, I've just quoted Isaiah, now let me expound on it. So as he expounds on it, he will then glean from what he has just quoted passages within his exp exposition. So what I do visually is I italicize in blue those passages that he's just quoted. And then I learn later that's a form of what a, Juba, a, a rabbi does when they do a midrash. Oh, wow. They'll take a passage, they'll read the passage, and then they'll make a commentary on the passage. Similar to what Christ did when he went to the synagogue, he opened up Isaiah, and then he said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. He's making commentary what he's just quoted. Right. So that is rabbinical. That's Hebrewism right there. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you'll see that in my work. 
hmm. and which gives you another reason why you pull the layer back. What farm boy in upstate New York in 1829, 28 is going to do that? How sophisticated is that? That's another one. I call those breadcrumbs. These breadcrumbs are spurs throughout the entire Book of Mormon. You get enough breadcrumbs, you get a slice, a loaf. If you get enough of the lo uh, slices, you get a loaf. And the loaf is pretty much proof that this can't come from just the mind of a charlatan. It has to have so much information in there that is impossible to plagiarize or to come up with it on your own. Or you knocked off this or you knocked off that. And I have enough of that. If I could give workshop after workshop after workshop, I can tell you all these breadcrumbs I've found. So you're just begging me to ask you, what do you think of William Davis's book? Have you read it? No, I have Visions not. Visions in the Searstone? Uh, oh. Did you watch my interview with, with William? Uh, not, no, I have not. Oh, okay. I need to do it, yeah. Okay, well, we might have to have a sequel then. And, That's right. And you'll have to watch that and read that book and see. Because he, because William, I mean, I think what you've done is amazing and, and impressive. But, I, you know, I always like to hear all sides of all the stories. Yeah, yes. And, and William says that... Uh, that there is evidence of oral tradition, that it was an oral dictation, um, and that Joseph had training in uh, as a Methodist exhorter and things like that. Yeah. So, and I um, think all of that has merit. I mean, there, there are elements to that because, again, it comes from the minor Joseph. He's the one that's involved in making the translation using what Jonathan Neville would say, his mental vocabulary that he had, his, uh, his way of expressing, and how did he do that, you know? I think Jonathan Neville's done a fantastic job of at least giving you rational explanation of how that could have happened, being that Joseph had that leg surgery, uh, he was bedridden, you don't have TV back then, you don't listen to the radio, they didn't have money to buy newspapers, you read the scripture. So he might be one of those gifted people like William B. that had a great photographic memory, could memorize stuff. So now, you know, they moved to Palmyra. And now he's got a farm and stuff, and he's still not well because he still limps. He's not completely healed. And now he's going to the town to get the newspaper. But now he's kind of like a vagrant in the sense that he's spending time looking at periodicals or something. And what's there? Jonathan uh, Edwards. And next thing you know, who's Jonathan Edwards? He's one of the leading theologians. He's as, the Billy Graham of his day. Exactly. Yeah. And the next thing you know, he's got phraseology within the Book of Mormon that has the same phraseology that John Edwards had. So it, it, it's a way of saying that he's taking this ancient record and putting it into how does this character through the aid of the Urim and Thummim, I get a handle on it, but here's how I would express it. And so that expression comes from his mental bank of how to express it. And so I think that that has some merit to it. And it, it helps you understand that it's not something that was just given to him with some 5th century you know, English. And so whoever is the one that's giving him the, the words on a stone that he's putting in his hat somehow it just doesn't make sense to me. It's, it, what makes more sense to me is actually using the plates He's actually having the spectacles that was designed to be used with those plates and then using his mental vocabulary to express what he's seeing. So that to me makes more sense. And then when you go into that uh, way of thinking and, and the work that I've done is that I find, and that's why I have these other books, I find that there are phrases within that Book of Mormon that come from these other books that Nephi saw in chapter 13. First Nephi chapter 13 near the end, he says, and I saw other books that would come forth that would testify of the prophets and the apostles and that these records would be there. And so in Doctrine and Covenants section 107, March 28, 1835, Joseph Smith, part of his that big long uh, section, these things were written in the Book of Enoch, and are to be testified of in due time. So oh. here's the Lord giving a prophecy to Joseph, who's already received Enoch in 1830, in Moses chapter six and seven. So 
if I'm Joseph Smith and I'm saying, wait a minute, Lord, you've already given me Enoch. I've got it in chapter 6 and 7. You know, he didn't call it chapter 6. It was six in seven. the book of Moses, right? It's in the book of Moses. Eventually that, was, that actually got printed over in England, but, in, you know, got into the Pearl of Great Christ. But anyways, guess what happens? 1835, three years later, in England, in the Bodleian Library, a manuscript that was done by Richard Lawrence that was written in Gies language, and which is back then called uh, Abyssinia, now called Ethiopia. Uh, James Bruce, an explorer, is looking for the source of the Nile River, and he, he's going to the libraries as well. He has an interest in antiquities, and he's been given three copies of this thing that is purported to be the Book of Enoch. So he goes back, he takes these manuscripts, he doesn't know anything about Gies language, Southern Semitic language. So he donates at the Bodleian Library, donates ones down to, in Paris, in the library down there, keeps one to himself. And Richard Lawrence, back in, now we're into, this is in 19, 1775 when this happens. Now we're up into 1821 when Richard Lawrence uh, transcribes it into English. But it's in a manuscript form, and it's only in that library in England. It wasn't until 1838, three years after that revelation was given, that it's in book form. 1840, Parley P. Pratt is now the editor of the Millennial Star in Manchester, England. Volume number one, he's reading the Book of Enoch. And the English, okay. Because now it's in book form. Right. At the same year, 1840, the Book of Jasher that was found in Jerusalem in 70 AD by a Roman soldier from the Iberian Peninsula. Roman soldier is decimating and destroying Jerusalem. The Roman soldiers want their spoils of war. This Roman soldier by the name of Cydrus from the Iberian Peninsula, which is now modern day Spain and, and, uh, and Portugal, He's, he, he feels that this wall doesn't look right. There's something, my treasures are behind there, my spoils of war are there. Let's break down this wall. They break down the wall. Lo and behold, there's a rabbi with a bunch of manuscripts. He sees dollar signs, whatever that means back then. He says, I know that the Jews are fleeing to the Iberian Peninsula. A lot of the rabbis were reading the scriptures. They knew that it was going to be destroyed, so they're fleeing. And they go there. So he says, I'm going to take the scholar along with the manuscripts and go to Iberia with them. And he did. He did it. And eventually that gets parsed out, these manuscripts, and they finally get printed here and there. The Sefer Yahashir gets published in Italy in 1625. It's in Hebrew, without points, meaning that it predates the Masoretic text that we get in the King James Version that was done in 1611. So what does that mean? It's without points, meaning the Mesorites were the ones that says, we need to standardize how the rabbis read the Torah because there's no vowels. We're going to put the vowels in by these points. And there's got to be a way you say the words or how you speak the words. So we're going to put in what they call diacritical marks above the lettering. So all the works that are done that we get have those marks in it. But this book of Jasher didn't. So now, this gets published in 1840 in England. I mean, it gets uh, translated in 1839 in England, and it gets published in 1840 in New York by Mordecai Noah. So that's, again, in 1840, the same year that the Book of Jasher is being read by Parley B. Pratt. And guess what? Chapters 3 and 4 in the Book of Jasher is about Enoch fulfilling the prophecy that, jo uh, that the Lord gave to Joseph. So I'll talk about that later in another episode or whatever. But I then find within the Book of Mormon passages from the Book of from the Book of Jasher. The so book how of does Jasher that that, was that got there. translated, meaning that it helps validate that what they found in Jerusalem is authentic, because it's showing up in the Book of Mormon. And how does that show up? And why does it show up? Because Nephi had to go get the plates of brass. And why? Because we have to keep the commandments. And the only way we can keep the commandments is to live the law of Moses. So we're going to have to get these plates. But now we've got the plates. So there's breadcrumbs interspersed throughout the Book of Mormon that show you that they did have the plates of brass. And so when I see passages from Jasher, 
when I see passages from Enoch in the Book of Mormon, in the Book of Mormon, those are the breadcrumbs, hmm. and then it, it dispels the idea that he has just. So where is he going to get plagiarism from? Do you have a? Could you just reference? Uh, that might be hard to do. Yeah, where, I'll give you a reference in one now. Where and something in the Book of Mormon references the Book of Jasher? I'll do it right now. Okay. Book of Jasher. Um, I give the, the title the Annal of the Early Hebrews. Let me explain right now. This is the Hebrew. This is Sefer, mm -hmm. and it's Hayasher. It's H A then Y A S H A R. Okay. And so they, it's you know whoever did the thing became Jasher. So there isn't anything called the Abraham or the Isaac or the Jacob. Ha Yasher is not a uh, proper noun or a proper name. Mm -hmm. Yasher means upright. So it's the book of the uprights. And who are the uprights? It's the people who are of the house of Israel. It's the patriarchs. Oh, the book of Jasher is a Old Testament style history from, it starts with Adam and Eve and it goes into Abraham and then it goes into uh, Isaac and Jacob and then it goes to Joseph of Egypt and then uh, Moses and then Joshua. So I look at here, I'm going to give you an example of where the piece comes in and the um, piece would be in page 123 and this is about Joseph of Egypt and the brothers when they I'll put them in a pit and so forth, and they're going to say, you know, what are we going to do? What are we going to do with? Them? What are we going to do with them? And what are we going to? What are we going to tell our father? So in the in the uh, Old Testament, you learn the the elements is that Joseph had a coat of many colors. Right. Uh, the other element is they put them in a pit, but now they're going to take a goat and they're going to kill a goat and they're going to put the uh, blood on the coat of many colors and they're going to give it to them. Oh, you know, here's what happened. You get you know you get killed by an animal. Right. Okay. So that's all you hear. But now listen to Moroni. This is Captain Moroni, and this is in um, Alma. He said, Moroni said unto them, Behold, we are a remnant of the seed of Jacob, yea, we are a remnant of the seed of Joseph, whose coat was rent by his brethren into many pieces. Yea, and now behold, let us remember to keep the commandments of God, or our garments shall be rent by our brethren. Or, or we be cast into prison, or be sold, or be slain. Yea, let us preserve our liberty as a remnant of Joseph. Yea, let us remember the words of Jacob before his death, before he saw that a part of the remnant of the coat was preserved and had not decayed. And he even said, Even as this remnant of the garment of my son hath been preserved, so shall a remnant of the seed of my son be preserved. So, and then he took the coat and so forth. So now we've got the idea that his coat was torn and that we don't want to be trodden down by our brethren. So we've got the tearing of the coat, renting of the coat, if you call it that in that language, and the trotting of our brethren. So where did he get that from? He didn't get it from our Masoretic text because there is no mentioning of his coat being torn or being trodden. Let's read in the book of Jasher. Issachar said unto his brothers, Here is an advice for you, if it seem be good in your eyes to do this thing. Let's take the coat which belongeth to Joseph and tear it, and kill a kid of the goats, dip it in his blood, and send it to our father. And they hastened and took the co Joseph's coat and tore it, and they killed a kid of the goats and dipped it in the coat in the blood of the kid, and then trampled it in the dust, and then they sent the coat to their father. That's a breadcrumb that's huge. Hmm. So where did Joseph Smith come up if he came up with this, those elements? Because Book of Joshua wasn't published until what year? 1840. Okay. Ten years after the Book of Mormon. Right. So then rhetorically, it seems to me that the Book of Joshua plagiarized the Book of Mormon. <laughs> <laughs> but that's one of many. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, I have and I have multiple things in here to show that. And so Book of Jasher was your second book. That was my second book. Now, by the way, I was going to mention, well, I think I mentioned this to you because um, the Christ Church had a booth there at the, at the conference. Yes. And, I was, and they think that they use uh, 
they've canonized the book of Jasher as their scripture. Is that right? And I, I did was not telling know that. Them, I, and I said, you know, you guys should get a copy of that for your library. <laughs> yeah, and the other, the other nice thing about this edition, and, I, and again, my intent to do all of this, by the way, is it's not for my benefit per se, because in reality, I've spent... I had to remortgage my house to get this stuff. It's similar. I'm almost like a Martin Harris <laughs> in that I've, <laughs> I've taken my life savings, basically, and put money into doing these things and hoping that people buy them. Now, it, it, the Book of Mormon has been successful, but my contract with um, the, you know, the Rod and, and, and that group is that I just get a little bit of a royalty. In other words, I'm, I'm just pittance. Right. But it's under my, I chose to do that. And I did that because I felt, um, it, since I'm a covenanted person, not to say they're not, I'm also a temple ordinance worker, so I, yeah, I'm reminded of it every week, the covenants that I, I, I take upon myself. But the Book of Mormon was never uh, made to be for gain. It, 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 the, the Lord told Joseph all over and over again, it's not, you know, it's not the gold, you know, the eyes, oh, look at how much money you get. That's why he was always under um, the uh, eye of the Lord to say, you know, you're going to do it for the benefit to bring, you know, the restoration. So I felt, yes, I had put a lot of time and effort to my money, my time, my effort, and so forth. So all I'm asking for is just a little bit of a royalty. And it's a little bit. I mean, it's tiny. When you look at the total purchase price and what the percentage is, it's, you know, it's tiny. Yeah. So, but the subsequent books, you know, I paid for them all. I did all the work. I did the designing. I'm a solo person, so it's, I'm self-taught. I'm self. Uh, the money that's coming from my own savings. So, right now I'm in the hole big time. I have not made a lot of money out of this. So, but so when I when I'm talking about these things, it's not to promote me, and to make me. Uh, get some money for a good living. I'm 71 years old, going on 72. I'm in retirement, so I don't, I don't really need the money per se in the sense that uh, I'm looking for this as extra income. I'm doing this because I want to get the word out that Joseph Smith is a revealer of ancient texts. The Book of Mormon is an ancient text. I am showing you enough breadcrumbs from these other works that the book contains other fragments of these other. So another way to look at this is that the Book of Mormon is a collection of fragments. And what I mean by that? Well, it's a long history of a long people over a thousand years. So Mormon, the editor, is going through the records and selecting this thing from Zenith, and I'm going to take this from Amulek, and I'm going to take these epistles that are, and these are fragments. And these fragments are being interspersed throughout his narrative. And then he'll make commentary, thus we see. So it's obvious that Mormon, the editor, is going through a whole bunch of material. And it's obvious to me that this is a, a collection of fragments. The Book of Abraham is a fragment. Joseph Smith receives a vision called, you know, the vision of Moses, the writing of Mo Those are fragments. We've got the Book of uh, Abraham on parchments. That's a fragment. So these fragments, in general, are not complete books. Yet, these fragments contribute to the volume of material that we have and the other books that would come forth that Nephi saw that would testify of the prophets and the apostles. And these fragments are so sufficiently Interspersed with these other records coming forth later that it gets translated from other languages into English that support the fragments that Joseph Smith provided to us with his revelations. And when you put them all together, it's almost impossible that he would say that you could fake this. Mm -hmm. And so I am bringing that forth with my works. And it's all to elevate Joseph Smith as being a true revealer of text. And so from my perspective, I see Joseph Smith as the control. In other words, I'm bringing forth information that no one has ever seen because there's nowhere you can go see it. You can't go to any library and find it. Right. So now later in life, the, this 
Ethiopic text and this Church Slavonic text and this Hebrew text and this Aramaic text. Let's compare it to this control that Joseph Smith said that came from him, from God. Let's go ahead and analyze that. It holds up beautifully. So now Joseph Smith has been validated as a revealer of ancient texts. Very interesting. I, you, well, I, I kind of want to jump back to, uh, to that conversation you had with, uh, with the church, or, not, or was it BYU? I'm not sure which. The church history department, the uh, scripture department. Scripture department, so it was with the church. Okay. Yeah. So two, the, the two things that they hated were the red letters. Yeah, and, and the, the map. map. So my question is, because um, you've got a lot of Heartland type maps in there, is that right? Yeah, there's some Heartland maps in there. Now, those maps, are, and I state it right uh, in that this is just suggested. Mm -hmm. But in the back in the appendix, I do have what I call a real authentic map. And it's based on the Joseph Smith papers. And I refer to it as, um, uh, what, how do I put it? I put it on as a, let me go find it here. I've got enough pages in here. Um, I refer to it as... Uh, here we go, I'm getting there. Connections between the Book of Mormon and church history. So this is the page I start with. And from this book, or from different elements of the Joseph Smith papers, I then highlight in this gold lettering specific locations that relate to church history that have something to do with the Book of Mormon. So based on that, what I then do in the back here is I take a uh, map and I overlay specifics uh, that relate to church history. So for ex one of the most, ex uh, you know, the big example is Joseph Smith is on his Zion's camp or the camp of Israel. So they're roving over the plains of the Nephite. And that's his language. That's what Joseph Smith is saying. So now we have the phrase, the plains of the Nephite, that's being uh, said by Joseph Smith, that's in the Book of Mormon. That's a Book of Mormon phrase. And it's in the Joseph Smith papers, coming from Joseph Smith. But you don't read. Um, so therefore, if that's the area that he is moving through, and he's calling it the plains of the Nephite, well, the Nephites must have been here because he says it's the plains of the Nephites. Which ties very in well to Heartland model, right? Exactly. And then if he says this is where uh, Adam on Diam and the altar is, now you don't see that in the Book of Mormon, but at least that's just part of church history, and it has to do with the location. Uh, and then he'll say this is where um, the ancient city of Manti is. It was in Randolph County, and it's here. And so now we have a Book of Mormon, uh, the city of Manti, uh, or... In section um, 125, I think, it says, now let the name Zarahemla be named upon it. That's the land across from Nauvoo. Now, we don't know precisely that is exactly what the Zarahemla is, but we do know that there's a Jerusalem and a new Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Is this something that could be a new Zarahemla? But he doesn't refer to it that way. But at least there's the idea that it could be something to do with Zarahemla. So I put that on the map. And then I have... Um, these things here. So this, this particular map here is really the mo most precise map I have because these are things related to church history that, that are in the Joseph Smith papers. Now, where is the River Sidon? Now, this is, we infer this. Everything is inference based on a pin in the map, meaning that Joseph Smith and others over and over again, Oliver Cowdery in his letters, the Hill Cumorah is in New York. And then we have statements by many church leaders that say, don't get confused, the Hill Camorra is in New York. So I put all of this as a pin as Jonathan Neville, that's his contribution. He would say, at least we know where one thing is, and that's where the Hill Camorra is. Now, a lot of professors and people in academics say, well, no, not really. That's where we get the two Camorra theory, you know. Well, and you know, yeah. I, I'm sure there are people here that may admire the work you've done, but they're going to be turned off with the Heartland theory stuff. Because, yeah. you know, there's South American model, there's Baja, there's other models. Exactly. And I guess my question is, and especially 1922, there were those, I don't know if you saw my Shannon uh, Caldwell Montez interview, yeah. but 
she had said that the church back in about 1920 had decided we need to get away from this geography model stuff because it's 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 too problematic my my question is would you consider creating an edition that was more uh geography neutral neutral yeah yeah and actually the church should be doing that but they're not every everything that they is talk like about the they have never been neutral <laughs> that's so weird about the but yeah they, they want us to be neutral but they're not yeah they have never shown anything in the in central in, in uh, North America they always show it as in uh, Mesoamerica all of the background has mountains in it it's got palm trees it's got uh, um, Chichen Itza type style temples that have nothing to do with the law of Moses but that's their choice all the artwork now, I'm going to be very bold here. People, you're going to hear this from Dave Hawking. We hear a lot about pornography in the church. You know, we have a problem with pornography. And what is biased recognition? It's a visual image that you can't get out of your brain, and it, de it desecrates the human body. These images of the temple that are in our church buildings, that's in our church material, to me is visual pornography. Why? Because those are not temples after the order of Solomon. You don't do the law of Moses types of sacrifices in these models that they show as images. And you can't get it out of your mind. And it desecrates the law of Moses. So for me, that's visual pornography. Hmm. Wow, that's pretty bold. It is very bold. But it, to me, that's what it is. Because you cannot get that out of your brain. And if, and if they attempt to do that, there's going to be a huge backlash. Like, you've been given this all this time. You know, image after image after image, iterations after iterations. And now we've got new videos that we're going to show you, and it's going to be the same image. And I think that's not right. If they're going to be truly neutral, they need to remove that kind of image and make it more Hebrew, not some other weird religion that has stone steps with a little square box. I've never been to a Mormon temple or go to a Hebrew when you go to the temple after the manor of Solomon that has multiple steps with a little square box at the top. They're all rectangular and they have different compartments and you go through these different and you'll never mm -hmm. see that as part of the depiction of where the Savior came. You see them in a Chichen Itza tile temple with these stone and, you know, you read the Book of Mormon, they never built out of stone. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, well, all I'm saying is that I'm trying to be authentic when I present material that's related to what the Joseph Smith papers are showing with how Joseph Smith taught his people. When he said, I'm picking up a bone of a Nephite, he's not doing that. <laughs> no, I'm, he's saying, you know, you've got a spiritual testimony of the Book of Mormon. You've got your spiritual witness. Just like you have a pre-mortal spirit, but you had to get your body here. You had to be a physical entity in order to have a complete person. And then when you're resurrected, like the Savior was, the Savior said, I want you to come forward and touch me. I want you to handle me. I want you to thrust your hand on my side. I want you to feel the prince of my finger. Because I am a human being and resurrected in a body of flesh and bones as you see me have you are now getting physical evidence that I'm real. So with the spiritual and the physical, you get a perfect knowledge and a pure knowledge. And so when Joseph Smith was picking up a bone of a, a white Lamanite called Zelf, he in essence to those 200 plus people is saying, I'm giving you physical evidence that we're roving over the mounds of these once great people, the Nephites, as evidence that they were here. Now, if that's blasphemy, then I'm proud to say that because that's what Joseph Smith... And who is Joseph Smith? He's the one that translated the Book of Mormon. He's the one that saw Moroni. He has a perfect knowledge of what he's talking about. He's not an academic. He's not doing research. He's giving you pure knowledge. Okay, so is, so you're not interested in doing a geography neutral? I could version? in the future if there's an interest in it. I could do that. Okay. Yeah, because I think what you've done is amazing. This has caught a, uh, a, a, a great deal of interest. Now, the Book of Mormon, uh, this edition, has, um, 
has been well sold. I don't know what the total number is. I don't know all the different things, even though I should know, <laughs> because I'm not the ones putting the money up for it. But I think it's close to 30,000 books have been sold. Wow. So that's not bad for a first-time edition of something. And so Duke Divinity School is going to be Heartland model, and you got BYU, which is Mezzo. Is that right? Yeah. Well, you know, and, and yet they say there's no map, but then what is BYU? They create a fantasy map that has no reality to any place on the earth. So, I mean, who's right? At least I'm showing the Joseph Smith papers and what Joseph Smith said or others have said or where things are. And it's something you can read that has a location versus something that is made up. So who's going to believe who? So that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. Well, cool. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with David Hawking. In our next conversation, we're going to talk more about some of these books like the Jasher, Enoch, and Isaiah. And we're also going to dive into the New Testament. He's got some really interesting things with the Joseph Smith translation. But now I'm going to do, you're going to turn a page, and there's going to be two insight pages. So now I'm going to compare the normal King James Version Beatitude, blessed are they, blessed are they. But right next to it, I'm going to give you the Joseph Smith translation of the Beatitudes. And look at the white space here. Mm -hmm. Look at what's being added. Now all of that is bracketed because that's coming from the new translation. Not, not a phrase or two. It's not uh, John, uh, Adam Clark that's making this. This is Joseph Smith. Well, you know, I don't want to get into the controversy. Oh, I do. If you like what we're doing here on Gospel Tangents, please become a paid subscriber at gospeltangents.com or patreon.com slash gospeltangents. We've got full transcripts on our website at gospeltangents.com. And if you'd like to check out some of our other conversations, click over here. Thanks. <laughs>